I'm a cheater at pottery. When it comes to ancient pottery, we replicators are just about all cheaters. Let me explain why that is. Most pottery replicators start out as people who appreciate the look and feel of ancient pottery. And so we then go about trying to figure out how to make it ourselves. The ideal is usually to make it as much like the ancients as possible to achieve exactly the same results. But that ideal is pie in the sky thinking because it's nearly impossible to achieve 100% authenticity. The reason is we live in a world that is very, very different from that that the ancient potters lived in. We are surrounded by and depend on tools for everything we do in life, tools that the ancient potters did not have access to. So if we go to do anything without these tools, it suddenly becomes very difficult to do even basic things. Take for example, fire. We today take fire for granted because it's really easy to just turn a knob on our stove or flick a lighter and have fire. But in ancient times, people had to work hard to make fire. Some pottery replicators like to start the fire for firing their pottery in an authentic manner, using authentic tools and techniques. But if you go to start a fire using authentic techniques, you need specialized equipment, you need specialized knowledge. It just adds a layer of complexity to creating that authentic replica pottery. Another great example is the way clay is ground to be used in pottery. I use a mechanical corn grinder to grind my clay, obviously not authentic. A lot of people insist on using the traditional mono and matate, which is great, but grinding your clay on a mono and matate takes a lot more time and energy in order to achieve the same results. And a matate is quite a bit more expensive than a corn grinder. So fire and grinding clay are just two examples of where pottery replicators draw that line. That line indicating just how far we are willing to go to achieve truly authentic pottery. We all draw that line in different places. Here are a few more areas where people draw lines between authentic and inauthentic. Purifying clay, using store-bought commercial pottery tools, using commercial paint brushes, using commercial clay, using plastic to keep clay from drying, using sandpaper to smooth pottery, using commercial underglazes, using chemical fluxes and deflocculants, using metal cover shirts and brick kiln furniture in firing. This reminds me of the first time I met Clint Swink. I had just given a presentation at the 2015 Southwest Kiln Conference about how I was going about trying to replicate Salado polychrome pottery authentically. In that presentation, I showed a picture of a firing I had done in which I used a bucket to shield the pot from the fuel during the firing. Later on that day, Clint saw me around the conference and took the initiative to chastise me about cheating, about not being as authentic as I could be in using that bucket. Some potters take this stuff very seriously, but not every potter has the time and energy to make sure every little thing is authentic all the way down the line. And some potters may just not want to focus on that minutia anyway. Some potters are ashamed of their cheating and keep these things secret. And other potters proclaim it loudly. My friend Wayne Keene is one of those. He always says that he's the most impure of all the potters at the Southwest Kiln Conference because of all the cheats that he uses in making his pottery. He uses commercial underglazes to paint designs. He fires in an electric kiln and takes advantage of many other modern shortcuts in his pottery. I'm telling you about this not to shame those of you who take these shortcuts, but to tell you it's okay if you're not 100% authentic all of the time. Every replicator I know takes shortcuts in one way or another. It all depends on where we draw that line I was talking about. Even that great guardian of authenticity himself, Clint Swink, has to draw that line somewhere. For example, should we dig clay with an authentic wooden digging stick, or is it okay to use picks and shovels? Should we carry that clay back to our studio on our back, or is it okay to drive it home in an automobile? In order to make pottery completely authentically to the way that the ancients worked, you would have to live your life the way Chad Zuber does, and most potters just aren't willing to go that far. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the cheats I use from time to time. First of all, commercial paintbrushes. I often use commercial paintbrushes on my work because I feel like the results, in the end, when you're looking at the finished product, are fairly equivalent to what you could achieve with a primitive paintbrush. I have yucca brushes. I do use yucca brushes frequently, as you've probably seen in some of my videos. 
But if you have watched some of my videos, you've also seen me use commercial brushes because I think the results are relatively the same either way. And I can paint a pot a lot faster using commercial brushes. And I don't have to go through the trouble of making the brushes ahead of time. Next, let's talk about cover shirts. When I fire my pottery, I can cover it with these broken pits of pottery, these cover shirts, to keep the fuel from touching the pottery and therefore keeping it from leaving dark blemishes called fire clouds on the pots. And these work really great. The trouble with traditional cover shirts is that they break down over time. Every time you fire with them, they break a little more, they crumble and they crack, and eventually they have to be replaced. And that's a lot of work, making new ones every once in a while, and then slowly they break down and you have to make more. It's very easy and convenient to use a metal bucket because it doesn't break down. I've used this for, I don't know, hundreds, at least dozens of firings, and it's just as good as the day I bought it. I mean, it doesn't look like much, but it really is just as good, and it's not, it's not breaking down. It continues to protect the pottery. So it's very convenient, but you know, it's not traditional. Uh, this was exactly the bucket that Clint Swink was yelling at me about, but uh, I've replaced dozens of cover shirts since 2015 when I talked to Clint about it, but I haven't had to replace this bucket. There are advantages to the modern ones. And again, I think the results, the results in the actual pottery, the outcome is exactly the same either way. And the last one I'm gonna talk about is cutting and scraping tools. Sometimes, if you've watched my video, you've seen me scrape the outside of a pot with this little deer rib or this piece of split river cane, and they work really good. Or you may have seen me use a piece of an old credit card, which also works good. In fact, it works better. Down in Mata Ortiz, Chihuahua, they like these little bits of hacksaw blade. They'll chop up an old hacksaw blade, and this works really good to scrape the outside of the pot. And you've got a serrated side and a smooth side. So you can really get after it with the serrated side, or you can smooth it out with the smooth side. The more modern methods, the hacksaw blade, the credit card, these are sharper edges. These are gonna be a better scraping tool than these more primitive scraping tools. Not quite as authentic. You have to keep that in mind. You have to weigh the consequences of what you're after. And the same goes for cutting tools. A commercial needle tool works really great for trimming rims or cutting any other holes out of the pot that you need. Works good, never wears out. Now I've made a primitive needle tool out of a mesquite tree thorn and a bit of a branch. So I've actually drilled a hole and glued it in there and it works just as good. Uh, eventually this is gonna wear out and I'm gonna have to replace it. Whereas uh, this commercial needle tool will never wear out. Now you wanna go really authentic because um, I don't believe the natives in this area were using primitive needle tools. At least uh, I don't think the archeological record supports that. You can use a stone blade, which is really great. Uh, you can get people that are flint nappers to make these for you and they work okay, but they don't work as good as a commercial needle or even as good as like a steak knife or something. So uh, there are some sacrifices you make and depending on how authentic you're trying to be or how much of a hurry you're in, you may choose different options based on those things. So my rule that I use to keep myself in line and for making authentic pottery is that I can use modern tools to make the tools to make pottery. So two examples, uh, this primitive needle tool, I used a drill and a hot glue gun to make this. I used modern tools to make this primitive tool. I can use modern tools to make the tools. Uh, the same goes for this corn grinder. The corn grinder makes the clay that I used to make the pottery. So in those rules that I used, it's okay. But I can't use modern tools on the pottery that I call authentic. So for example, the hacksaw blade or the credit card, I can use those. But when I do, then I have to tell people this isn't made 100% authentic. So I used modern tools on it. Generally, I used modern tools to make the tools, the primitive tools that I used to make the pottery. Let me show you how that works. When I make gourd scrapers, I use a commercial saw to cut the gourds open. Sometimes I use a saber saw to cut the gourds. And then once I've got those pieces of gourd formed, I use either a rasp or a belt sander to further refine the shape down to what we want. Organic paint is another good example. Organic paint is completely authentic, but when I make organic paint, I put it in a big metal pot and boil it down. And then I might use a paint strainer to strain out all the solids. And then I might put it on my stove and cook it down even further using propane to heat it. You know, I'm not using completely authentic tools to make the tool or the material that is the organic paint. And the last one is polishing stones. I don't make polishing stones. I buy them from the gem show, but they're tumbled in a lapidary tumbler. And so I'm buying them from a commercial manufacturer that goes out and probably cuts the stone with some kind of like a diamond blade and then puts them in a tumbler and makes them all round and smooth. And then I'm mailing them out using the US mail, which is another thing that the ancient potters didn't have. So 
you have to draw that line somewhere. You can't go out, well, I mean, you can go out and live like Chad Zuber if you want, but uh, that takes a lot of energy. That's gonna consume your entire life. Uh, so if that's what you wanna do, more power to you. I know more than just Chad that lives this way. Uh, the trouble is, I mean, most of us live modern lives, we have jobs, we drive our car to the grocery store, and then we want to come home and make some pottery. We don't want to have to go through the process of making everything authentically all the way down the line. If you're trying to get started in primitive pottery and you're not really sure where you're going to get all the tools you need, I do sell a lot of these on my website. I sell these gourd scrapers that I show you how I make. Uh, I sell these polishing stones that I buy. I sell different kinds of clay slips. I sell these yucca leaves that you can use to make brushes. So uh, if you are interested in that, uh, go to my website, check out my shop, and I'll put the link here on the screen and down in the doobly-doo where you can purchase some of those things. And as far as I know, it's pretty much the only place online that sells primitive pottery tools. I think that trying to be 100% authentic as a replica potter is a fantastic goal to strive towards. But we also need to be realistic about what we can achieve and be honest about how we're actually doing it. If you'd like to learn more about how I use modern tools to make primitive tools that I use in making pottery, I've got a video showing how I made several different tools, and I'll link that up right over here. So go watch that, learn more about making your own tools, and I'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching.